The next item addresses issues of mental health, depression, and suicide. For available support services, contact the Canada Suicide Prevention Service at crisisservicescanada.ca. In addition to being a subject you simply didn't talk about, suicide also used to be something the media did not cover. However, for journalist and author Anna mailer Paperni, the topic is a personal one. And in her new book, Hello, I Want to Die, Please Fix Me, Depression in the First Person, she opens wide that very difficult conversation with journalistic rigor. Anna mailer Paperni is a reporter for Reuters, and she joins us now. Oh, my God. This book is harrowing. It is harrowing. I want yeah. to start off the top by saying, let's just... This is a tough topic. We're talking suicide, your own personal story, but also what's going on society-wide. So I guess we should warn people, this conversation is not going to be for everybody. Yeah. But we hope people will watch. And let's just start with some of the stats that you gathered here. Sheldon, bring this graphic up, if you would, please. In Canada, on average, 11 people are lost to suicide every day. Canadians are 10 times more likely to kill themselves than be killed by somebody else. 800,000 people around the world kill themselves every year, and that works out to 2,200 per day. Anna, I'm going to get real personal with you off the top here, and these questions are appallingly personal, okay. but you write about them, so yeah, here we go. How many times have you tried to kill yourself? I think eight. It depends what you count as a discrete attempt, but yeah. What's the difference between a, what did you call it, a discrete attempt? Like sort of, you know, for example, um, this one day I tried to break my window and jump out to my death, and I couldn't break the window, so then I uh, swallowed a month's worth of lithium. Does that count as two attempts or one? I count it as one, my psychiatrist counts it as two, so we agree to disagree. So those are the kind of like lines that you draw when you're trying to count and you're not sure sort of what, what counts as an attempt. Okay, regardless of what the number is, it's a big number and do you know why the number is so big? It's because I have treatment resistant depression. I have um, a type of depression that doesn't respond well to the conventional treatments we have out there and we're still trying to find a treatment that works. I've been getting treatment now for um, eight years and my psychiatrist and I have had the same psychiatrist for several years. We're, st we're still trying to land on a combination of medications and psychotherapy that is effective at alleviating my despair and making the desire to die go away. Do you feel depressed right now? Right now, I'm happy to be here. Um, but I have tough mornings, yeah. But at the moment, you're OK. At, at, right at this second, I'm not jumping off a bridge. <laughs> Well, we have no bridge here for you, but... Perfect. But just... So we're, we're safe. Okay. Are you, are, are you on medication right now? Yes. Can you tell us what you're taking? Yeah. Uh, I'm taking lithium, which is a mood stabilizer that's been found to alleviate uh, suicidality. I'm taking paliperidone, which is an antipsychotic, but sometimes antipsychotics are found to be good at um, sort of adjunct, uh, like in, in, in addition to antidepressants. I'm taking Parnate which is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It's a kind of a more old school antidepressant. Um, and every three days I take ketamine, which is a much more experimental treatment that's sometimes been found to alleviate depression. This is quite a cocktail. How long yes. did it take for you and your um, doctor to figure out what levels of everything gave you the most effective bump? We're still figuring that out, actually. Okay. Um, I'm on steady levels of the lithium, the paliperidone, and the ketamine. We're increasing right now the level of the parnade. We're hoping that it has more of an effect than what I've been on so far. But it's, it's still an experiment. It's a work in progress. Yeah. Again, I'm going to apologize for asking the question, but again, you've talked about this in the book. Tell me how you've tried to kill yourself, the different ways. So the first time um, was with antifreeze and sleeping pills. You, you drank antifreeze? Yeah, quite a bit. Um, that landed me in an ICU. I had to get dialysis for several hours to clear the poison out of my system. So that was the first time. Um, I've tried overdosing on lithium. I've tried overdosing on aspirin, on um, an antidepressant that I was taking. Um, I've tried uh, suffocating myself with plastic bags. Um, I considered trying rat poison, but then I chickened out. Um, my most, I tried, uh, my most recent attempts was, um, also with, was with windshield washer fluid. 
um, and uh, painkillers. You say your most recent attempt. How long ago was that? That was in February. February of this year? Yeah. Am I allowed to say I'm glad you failed? That's very sweet of you. Well, I mean it. Thank I'm you. I'm glad you failed. Thanks. Um, those are notoriously not necessarily effective ways to take one's life, which raises the question of whether you were really trying to take your life. I've asked myself that a lot. Um, my psychiatrist thinks I was. Poisoning tends to be um, the go-to for a lot of women, whereas men, I mean, in the U.S., they tend to try firearms. In Canada, firearms aren't as readily available, so they'll try jumping or suffocation, strangulation. Um, at the time, I certainly felt like I just wanted to die, but I think I also wanted to try things that, if I failed, wouldn't, um, were recoverable from. Because uh, a gunshot which, wound to the head is not really recoverable no, from. No, you don't get a second chance there. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's contradictory, because you're right. Um, I chose methods that weren't necessarily the most fatal. Um, but the desire, the sort of desperate sense of hopelessness and despair was very much present. The desire to end the pain is what it's yeah. all about. Yeah. Do you know whether your attempts have had a long-term impact on your overall health? I don't think so. Um, my most recent attempt, there was a bit of a brain injury. I mean, there, there have been brain injuries that show up as uh, the effects of stroke on brain scans. Mm -hmm. So in one of my subsequent attempts, um, they, they found relics of a previous one when they did MRIs. So I know that they show up. I know that there's like brain tissue that looks like, makes me look like a former stroke victim. Um, but I've been very lucky in that the long-term effects have been, again, things that I can recover from. Um, as you sit here tonight, having written a very excellent book Thank about you. your life and about the whole issue, can I presume that you are glad that you failed given what a contribution you've made to this conversation, and that you now presumably have a second shot at life. Most days I'm very glad to be alive. Most days? Not all days. Hmm. Okay. Um, I gotta just go off the question sheet for a second. Because you were, no, no, this, you've been a guest on this program before. You yeah. came on this program to talk about economics, which is what you, you know, one of the things you report on. And I got to tell you, I didn't have a clue. I knew none of this, obviously. Yeah. I hadn't read your book yet. This was many months ago. I didn't have a clue that any of this was a part of your life or your background. Which you is don't, by design. Well, you don't give off any vibe that you're suffering from depression or mental illness or that you're troubled or any of that kind of thing. How are you able to do that? I think a lot of people who have mental illness go through life projecting a sense of wellness, projecting the sense that they're coping, they're functioning. You know, they're the, the, the walking wounded in a sense because it, it doesn't diminish the the impact on their lives, the, the debilitating anguish that they're under. Um, but people, because there's still so much stigma, because there's a fear that people would respond to you differently if they knew, um, you tend not to allow that out there. Well, everyone's going to know now. I know I'm scared. Are you? A little bit. I mean, your employer, your employer presumably knew already. Yes, and I, I mean, I mean, yeah, they didn't know everything, but... Um, well, they do now. They do now, um, and they've been very supportive. Do you know that people at your, at your workstation have read the book? I think some of them have. And do they treat you differently now? Uh, no, but I've been away for a little while, so I'm going back. <laughs> We're so we'll going to find out. Yeah, exactly. You know, when I came up in journalism many moons ago, suicide was nothing we ever reported on because there were always great fears that people would copycat. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, in your view, is that something we should legitimately worry about? It's something that should... The idea of contagion is a legitimate concern, but I think we've given it too much... We've allowed it to have too much power over what we, um, what we say mm -hmm. and how we say it. And I think we need to keep in mind that this is something that people are going through, whether or not you mention it. The people who are most at risk of suicide are contemplating suicide right now, whether you, meant, whether you bring it up or not. By bringing it up, you give it a chance to, you know, get some fresh air. You give it a chance for us to confront it directly. You give it a chance to tell people that there are modalities of treatment out there. There are ways to get help. Of course, the challenge is making sure that that help is there when people need it. But I think we've allowed our fear of contagion to dictate 
our discourse far too mm. much. I remember talking to a father once whose son was, and this was the expression he used, lost to suicide. Mm. He didn't like the expression, my son committed suicide or my son killed himself, because in his view, his son wasn't being himself and therefore was lost to this disease called suicide. As we try to get the vocabulary around this accurate and correct, what's your advice on that? It's tough. I, I tend to use the phrase kill themselves just because it's the most direct. And I think it because it causes a certain recoil. You say that, and it's awful. It sounds terrible. Pretty stark. Yeah. But it should, it should sound stark. It is, it's a stark ending. Um, so my, my uh, bias is towards bluntness. Um, but I can understand, especially as a parent, not wanting to ascribe that in intent to your son. What percentage of the population do you think at some point in their lives contemplate suicide? Seriously? Um, not even seriously, like yeah. not even, but just, you know, those thoughts pop into the, something awful happens or you're depressed or whatever, and that thought pops into the head. I think that's a lot higher than what we suspect. I'd say easily a fifth, but maybe more. Um, because it's, it's not just depression. It's bipolarity, mm -hmm. it's schizophrenia. It's a whole host of mental illnesses can give rise to suicide. Well, some people can just, you know, get dumped by their boyfriend or girlfriend, and that does it too, right? So, but I, w one thing that I've often heard from people was, you know, I thought about it, but I couldn't put my parents through that. I couldn't put my kids through that. I couldn't put, you know, all of that. Why has that, I don't mean this to be a judgmental question, no, but no. why does that not hold you back from making these attempts, these attempts, because, you, I mean, you quote your parents in the book, and, oh my God, lady, you've put them through hell. I have, and I feel horrible. Um, one of the worst sources of guilt that I have is what I've done to my family, because I do adore them. These are people I genuinely love, and I've hurt them. And all I can say is, there are moments of despair when the need for relief, the need to escape that despair overrides even the greatest love that I have for the people closest to me in my life. That really speaks volumes about what, what's going on in your head, doesn't it? Yeah. And do they get that? I think so. I think they do now. I think it was, I think it was hard for them, but they've been through this a lot now. Um, that's when they get it. I want to ask you about another awful part of your life, if you don't mind. You were, I don't know what the right expression is, confined to a psychiatric ward? Yeah. At one point in your life? A couple points, yeah. A couple points. What was that like? Tough. It's scary. Um, especially, I find, being in the psychiatric emerge. Um, like, you're with people who, by definition, are in this acute crisis stage of their lives. Um, and, you know, in need of immediate intervention often waiting for it in this, you know, you're in this like dull fluorescent room. You don't have any privacy. You can't keep your shoelaces. Um, it's, it's scary. And then what's, what's even scarier as you would sort of spend more time there is when you realize that um, a doctor has decided you can't make your own treatment decisions, that you're not allowed to leave. Now I've been in psych wards both voluntarily and involuntarily and I can say with certainty that being there voluntarily is a lot better because you're there, you're sort of in the driver's seat of your own treatment. When it's involuntary, how difficult is it to then trust the people that are trying to make you better? It's harder because it, it creates that sort of adversarial relationship mm -hmm. where, and, and I think that's where psychiatry falls down a lot, is that because the illness is in your brain and because so frequently people with mental illness lack insight into their condition. Um, there's sort of this adversarial dynamic set up, which makes it really difficult to help somebody get well because you're not seen as sort of co-collaborators in this, which I think needs to change. When you've been committed involuntarily, what was your, for example, your parents' reaction to that? Do they want to get you out or were they content to see you in there or what? Um, I think at the time, it was in the immediate aftermath of a suicide attempt and they, they were deferring to the experts. And they, I mean, on the one hand, they, they sympathized with my desire to have more autonomy, but I think they were also scared at the prospect that I could just walk out. They didn't want me walking out and killing myself again. Mm. So um, I think at the time, 
they were um, they were on the side of committal. There is no doubt your family members at some point in their lives have asked themselves the question, is there anything I could have or should have done so that Anna wouldn't be trying to kill herself as often as she has? What's the answer to that question? It's so hard because, yeah, these are, again, these are people that I love and I want to tell them like, yes, here's what, here's what you have to do to make everything better. But the truth is, and I tell them this again and again, there isn't something that they can do to fix this. This isn't within their power. They didn't cause it and they can't alleviate it. And that's hard for them to know because they want to be able to fix it. Well, you say they didn't cause it, but, but by having you and given that, you know, whatever unique connection your mom and dad had in creating you, that's made, I mean, that's, that's what's made you what you are, presumably, right? To a degree. We don't really know the source of depression, and you know, there are different theories as to what causes it, what, you know, what's environmental and what's genetic. We don't really know. Um, so it's, so they shouldn't it's hard feel to say. Guilty. I, I don't want them to feel guilty. Okay. Uh, okay, can I do an excerpt from the book here? Yes, I can. Here we go. This is from Hello, I Want to Die, Please Fix Me. This isn't rocket science. Rocket scientists know how rockets work. The best psychiatrists in the world know astonishingly little about how the brain functions on a good day, let alone how it becomes diseased and how to treat it when it does. They don't know where depression comes from or precisely how to map it in the brain or why some interventions work on some people sometimes. So where does that leave the diagnosed? Okay, that's a great question. Where does that leave folks like you? You need to have you need to trust, but you also need to have a healthy skepticism. You need to you need to be okay with the fact that we are so ignorant about depression, about its origins, about its functioning, about how our treatments work. And you need to say, you know what? We don't know why these antidepressants are effective, and we don't know why they're effective on some people but not others. But I'm gonna try anyway, because it's better than the alternative, which is despair. And that's why I find the best psychiatrists are very humble in their approach. They say, you know what, I don't, this might work, it might not. I don't know why it works if it does. But the evidence we have shows that it's worth a try. And that can be the most effective thing because, again, then you're sort of enlisting the patient with you. You're saying, we're together on this. We, neither of us know what's going on, but we're going to try. And that makes it so much better than feeling alone. How hopeful are you that the cocktail you're on right now is the right mix of everything that is eventually going to get you to the finish line? It depends on the day. Some days I feel hopeful. I think, you know what, this is going to work. There's evidence for it. It's, you know, uh, it's worked on other people. And there are times when I think, what if nothing works? What if I'm constantly battling this? And I try not to dwell on that because that you know, that way madness lies. How many days in a row have you woken up happy? Um, I mean, there are times when it's been several days. There are times when I could say like there have been five, maybe five or six. And it's hard because like, you know, there are different degrees of happiness. There are degrees of being able to cope. Um, but I think I've had good weeks. Good weeks. Yeah. Is that enough? No. I would like more. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm greedy that way. I don't blame you. Let's talk about some of the differences here in um, suicidal thoughts and different treatments depending on different circumstances. For example, urban versus rural. What's the difference in how things go? I mean, the difference is that, if, you know, if you're a rural resident, so many of the most basic interventions aren't there. You may not have a psychiatrist nearby. Telepsychiatry, we found works, but it's not always available. You may not even have a family doctor who can prescribe you basic medication. You may, the nearest hospital might be hundreds or thousands of kilometers away. Um, so all these things that we take for granted living in the city uh, just don't exist. And you could be on a wait list. You could have to spend hours on a bus to get the most basic care. Now, in the city, it's far from perfect. In the city, you, know, you could be waiting for hours and hours in an emergency room. You could find yourself waiting for months to get a consultation with a psychiatrist. I was in—I had an appointment in a hospital in Toronto recently, um, and they said they had a year-long wait list for people referred by their GPs to see a psychiatrist. If this were any other medical condition, 
people would be outraged. But because it's a mental illness, it's seen as acceptable. Well, you break your leg, you're in ER right away and getting fixed. Yeah. That's the way it works. But not for mental health. No. How about men versus women? What we found is that men are more likely to kill themselves, but they're not more likely to try. It tends to be that they're more likely to choose lethal methods. So attempts, women are actually more likely to attempt suicide in Canada and the U.S. So women have more attempts because they, they are not successful, if I can use that word. Yes. I mean, I try not to use successful versus failed too much because it describes, like, value. Right. Um, you mentioned that in the book, and I did it no, anyway. No, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, they tend not to, they're called like completed suicides. They tend not to kill themselves, um, but they do tend to try more. And men tend to choose more lethal methods. And that could be lifestyle things. It could be sort of like just stereotypical, you know, what's available to you. Um, but it, in terms of like the desire to die, we, it's not like there's a big difference between men and women. How about uh, white versus black versus Asian versus Latino versus uh, indigenous? How about all that? The stats are much higher for indigenous people in Canada. Mm -hmm. And that's staggering. And what's terrifying is how much higher they are for indigenous youth. And I mean, in part, that's because, you know, when you're, when you're growing up in a circumstance where you're undervalued, like literally you're getting less, you know, funding per capita in education than a non-Indigenous student. When you're getting less funding, you know, when you're being uh, transferred from one foster home to another, um, it creates an environment where you feel like your life is worth less. But we also get give them less care. So those are two major factors behind that disparity. Um, in terms of black and white, we don't know very well in Canada, but what we know in the US is that um, the statistics uh, suicide rates for black people are lower. And I've spoken with people who are skeptical of that conclusion. They say it could be just because we're less likely to see this as a suicide if it's a person of color. Hmm. Uh, in our remaining moments, I want to do one more excerpt from the book here. Sheldon, if you would, let's put the graphic up. One of psychiatry's most persistent bogeymen is the fear of turning normal human emotions into disorders. But here's the thing. If the way I feel is just part of being human, for F's sakes, give me death. I cannot countenance the assertion that this hopeless chasm is simply an extreme on a spectrum of healthy emotion. It has no relation, however distant, to sadness. People do see depression related to sadness. How would you describe what it feels like to be depressed versus sad? Sadness feels like a human emotion that, while unpleasant, is ultimately healthy. It reminds me that I'm a human being, I'm capable of feeling loss, whereas depression is just despair. It's like you've been sucked dry. There's no, there's nothing there, there's nowhere to go, there's no end in sight. You're without hope. And for me, that's very different. I want to ask you one last question, and that is, has writing this book been helpful to you? Yeah, it's been cathartic in a lot of ways. It's forced me to question a lot of my, my own assumptions. Um, but having come up with it, uh, I've, the response that I've gotten has been amazing. And hearing from people who found that it spoke to them, well, it made me sad because it, made, it makes me sad to think that somebody you know, is going through this pain. Um, it's been really gratifying to know that people got something out of it. I think you've made an amazing contribution to the whole conversation around this. Thank it's you. It's been absolutely essential. I'm telling you, this is one of the best books I've ever read. And I've read a lot of them. You see the shelves in the studio. <laughs> and I just hope you'll keep on keeping on. Thank you so much. Because we do want you back here to be a guest on other shows when we talk about boring stuff like the economy and mining and all that stuff. Okay. I'll come back on. Deal? Deal. Anna Mailer Paperni. Hello, I want to die. Please fix me. Depression in the First Person, a must-read. Thanks, Anna. Thank you so much for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.